This morning, I want to begin with a Civil War story. The United States Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton was his name. He was just glowering with anger, almost to a rage, at Judge Holt, the Chief of Military Justice. He said, I want you to present the charge against these deserters in the strongest possible terms. Lips tight, with concurring displeasure, Holt nodded. Stanton declared, we need stronger discipline in the Army. The time has come when the President must yield to our wishes. He was mad at President Lincoln. It was after a little, after a battle at Chancellorville, a crushing defeat for the North. Several Union soldiers who had failed to march with their regiments were arrested and locked up in a stockade. They were tried at court-martial and they were condemned to die. All that was needed to carry out the sentence was the signature of President Lincoln. And Stanton had chosen his prosecutor well. Judge Holt had few equals in his ability to, to um, orate. Then a few years passed. After the war was over, some 30 years later, a few months before his death in 1894, the retired Judge Holt told the rest of the story. In presenting these cases to the wishes of the Secretary of War, I used all the legal skill that I could muster. One morning, with papers all ready, he said I proceeded to the White House. As I entered the private office, President Lincoln looked up with his long, sad face. Ah, Holt, what have you there? Sir, I have some important papers for your, your consideration. The documentary evidence to condemn every man. Lincoln looked over the papers in his hand for a while. His face grew even sadder and more serious. He was tight-lipped and pensive as he looked across the Potomac. Then rising from his chair, he placed the folded papers in a compartment. Then facing Judge Holt, Lincoln said in sad, measured tones, Holt, you acknowledge that these men have a previous record of bravery, don't you? It's not the first time these men have faced danger, and they shall not be shot for this one. Knowing that the Secretary of War would explode with rage over the President's pardon, Holt said, I passively and passionately pled the necessity that these men be brought to justice in order that we might have discipline in the Army. Rising from his chair again, Lincoln riveted his eyes on the judge and asked, Holt, have you ever been in the front line of battle where bullets were whizzing over your head? No, I have never been, sir. Did Stanton ever march in the front line of combat and be shot at by the enemy, as these men did? I think not, sir, he said. Then Lincoln replied, I tried it in the Black Hawk War one time, and I grew awful weak, and I didn't think my knees would carry me another step further. I heard the whine of bullets all around me. I saw the enemy at first, right in front of me. How my legs carried me forward at that day, I can never know. Yeah, I felt like I was just going to sink into the ground. The men against whom these charges are made, they were probably not able to march into battle. Who knows if they were even able at that point, having gone through this before. I'm opposed to having soldiers executed for not facing danger when it is not known that their legs would carry him any step further. Then Lincoln returned to his desk, penned a few lines on a piece of paper, handed the paper to Judge Holt, and stated with finality, send this dispatch ordering the soldiers to be released from the stockade. On that day, they were freed to return to their ranks 
we might say renewed soldiers. Uh, we might even call them justified believers. Justified believers. I'm going to spend a few Sabbaths talking about justification in its relationship to sanctification in the near future. These are justified believers. Quite a story. This morning I want to relate another story, the greatest story ever told. During his whole earthly sojourn, Jesus bore our iniquities as one of us. He was fully touched with the helplessness and the hopelessness of sin. He knew what weak knees were. Yet he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem, and he went through with that awful ordeal. Garden of Gethsemane on a Thursday night and on Friday, the crucifixion. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible says that with strong cries and tears, he fervently interceded for us there in Gethsemane, when all hope was gone, blood dripping from his forehead onto the ground. And he pled with his father for strength to carry out the mission to overthrow the kingdom of darkness and set Satan's captives free. That's us. This was the civil war of wars. He was the trailblazer for our salvation, as we read in our scripture reading today, the author of our salvation, the trailblazer. And what a trail it was. I'd like to have you turn with me to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and I want to read three of the verses that we just read in the scripture reading. Hebrews chapter 12. We'll start with verse 2. Hebrews 12, verse 2. If you have it, say amen. Okay. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, there was a joy set before him because he saw us, you know, way down here in 2020. He saw us. There was a joy set before him. There was joy over, over the idea that people would get it and could be saved in his kingdom. And for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, yet ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. But he did. Yes, he did. And no, we haven't yet resisted unto blood in our struggle with sin, have we? But he did. Back a few pages, Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Well, Lord, we read some of these verses the other night. You remember that? <laughs> Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. I went back too far. It says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciling for the reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in himself, in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. <clears throat> God permitted his son to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. Yes, I said a risk. In Desire of Ages, page 40, 49, it says it was with risk. Now, great risk to himself and the, in cre the, in the created universe becoming human, he put himself at great risk. There was risk. The very character of God was, at, the, the revelation of the very character of God was at stake in what was being done. It was no make-believe battle for Jesus. 
From the onset, Satan strove to undermine Jesus' decision to save us, right from the very beginning. Revelation 12, right from his birth, indeed. At all cost, any cost to himself. The big question is, could a man, the God-man, filled with the Holy Spirit and his supreme love for his Heavenly Father, could he accomplish that mission? And would it work? All heaven was watching. Watching pensively. Jesus had great faith in his Father. The Bible calls it the faith of Jesus. Have we met up with that phrase someplace else? Revelation 12, verse... I'm sorry, Revelation 14, verse 12. Faith of Jesus. Keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It doesn't say faith in Jesus. It says the faith of Jesus. That's what will be found in those final people who really get this. And that's what we all, are, all want to be a part of. His constant prayer life was the evidence of his faith. Think about your prayers. Are your prayers the evidence of your faith? We pray because we expect that God will accomplish for us what we pray for, right? And we have faith that that will happen. This was the faith of Jesus. His prayer life was evidence of his faith. Notice the words of a part of a prayer in John 17. In the very shadow of the cross, John chapter 17. And I want to read verses 4 to 6. John 17, verses 4 to 6. Here's what it says. John 17, 4 to 6. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. This is in the very shadow of the cross. The work was almost finished. And now, O Father, glorify that fly thou me with thine own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested my name unto men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them me, and they have kept my word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are for thee, are of thee. Great evidence here for a triune God in this passage, by the way. Jesus is not talking to himself here, is he? He's talking to his Father in heaven. Laying aside his divinity and an infinite anguish in Gethsemane for the guilt of all of our sins, drops of blood fell from his forehead to the ground. He resolved to emancipate us from the stockade where death penalty hovered over all of us. Sixty centuries of earth people were, on the, were, on the, were at stake at whatever cost to himself, whatever risk there was. I don't know what the risk was. My pay grade isn't that high. There was a risk that he took on our behalf, and he was willing to do it at any cost to himself. He adopted the human condition in its weakened state after 4,000 years of sin had ravaged the human frame and relies solely for strength and support from his father. Romans 8, verse 3. Romans 8, verse 3. <clears throat> for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin, in the flesh. In the person of Jesus, sin was condemned finally and fully and completely. And actually, you know, um, this might be an, a new thought to you, but he actually slew our sinful nature in himself. You all have a sinful nature, right? Even at, for conversion, we all have a sinful nature. Is that true? The truth is we have two natures, and those two natures are in conflict often. You can read about that in Galatians chapter 5. But he slew our sinful nature in his person. Let's read it. 
It's Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. This is huge. Knowing this, that our old man, who's that? That's the sinful nature, right? Uh, Paul calls it the, the fallen nature. He calls it the flesh. Uh, he calls it the carnal nature. Here he calls it the old man, the old man of sin. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Now, what is the tense in this verse? For us, it's past tense, isn't it? It's present tense. When he dies on the cross, our sinful nature is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And later on the chapter, it says that sin shall not have dominion over us. We don't have to be slaves to sin. Do we sin once in a while? Yes, we do. Probably every moment or every day. But um, Ellen said she's thankful that we have forgiveness. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. These can be favorite verses. We can pour over these verses and we can find great, the greatest comfort. Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Why? Because he was God, right? But made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. That's the second time we've read that word likeness. It's in Romans chapter 8 also. And being fashioned, found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the, name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In his spotless innocence, he never ever depended on self. That's what sin is. If we had a list here and we would were to write and 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 we're to write the word selfishness. And we begin to list all the sins. Every sin that's ever been committed comes under that general heading. Is that right? He never depended on self. Even his divine self, his wonderful self, his, his ancient of days self. He suffered for the penalty of our sins. Opened the floodgates of mercy and pardon for a whole world of sinners, 60 centuries of them, 60 centuries of earth people. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 that he is the lamb slain from the what? Foundation of the world, starting with, the, with righteous Abel who died. What more could a good God do? And yet, sadly, humans put fingers in their ears and in their eyes and don't want to hear it or see it. That's blasphemy, isn't it? Why do you suppose that is? Why do you suppose that fallen men don't want to hear that? You know, it glories, it humbles the glory of man in the dust. Nobody wants to be humbled that way. I read in the inspired writings that the highest place that we can reach in this life is at the, is the foot of the cross, at the foot of the cross. Achieving, achieving victory, he rose from the grave and he's now our high priest and priest in heavenly places. And then all, there's a number of times, I think I counted eight or nine times where it says in the New Testament that he returned to the Father and he sits at the throne of the universe but he's also our high priest in those heavenly places, ministering for us, our advocate. First John chapter two. You know, we not only have Jesus as our judge according to John, but we also have him as our judge. 
we have him as our friend. And 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Here's what it says. My little children, these things I write unto you. Don't you just love the way John talks to us? <laughs> Here we are, little children. <laughs> I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, propitiation is a big word. <laughs> it means expiation. <laughs> That's a big word too, right? But it can also be translated mercy seat. Now, we understand that one, don't we? Jesus is in the most holy place of heaven, heaven's sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant is, and the lid of that Ark is called the mercy seat, under which is, is stored away the, the Ten Commandment law of God and the law that had been broken by all of us. Mercy seat. He's our mercy seat. The penalty of the law located just beneath the mercy seat completely exhausted by the blood of Jesus, the guilt and what we owe to the law. The law stands back and says it's enough for this one, for that one, for me too, for all of us, it's enough. Billions of people, because they have put their faith and trust in the blood of Jesus. They love Jesus. They love life eternal. The redeemed would rather die than sin when they really get this, what he did, what he accomplished for us and what cost it was. You know, Jesus' work in heaven is as important to us as was his death on the cross. What he's doing, I want to say that again in another way. What he's doing for us as our high priest in heaven is as important to us as was his death on the cross. Why would I say a thing like that? Let's look at it in Hebrews. Hebrews 7, verse 22 and 25. Hebrews 7, verses 22 and 25. If you ask the average person in the street, where's Jesus? You might get some interesting answers. I've asked people that question, where's Jesus? And uh, Hebrews chapter 7, it's kind of like when Moses went up on the mountain and the people came to Moses, or to, came to Aaron, and they said, you know, Moses has been gone a long time, uh, 40 days. We don't know what's become of him. And uh, it's kind of like that with Jesus. He went away a long time ago, right? He's been gone a long time, 2,000 years, plus or minus. And where is he? What's he doing? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, or we might say the new covenant. Verse 25. Verse 25. Wherefore, he is able to save them unto the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth. He's living, and he's living in heaven. And Hebrews chapter 8 says he's in the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary, right? He ever liveth to make intercession for us. And the real clincher is in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Hebrews 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by what? His own blood. I don't mean by, by interpreting this text that he took some blood with him back to heaven, but the principle of blood is what is needed. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul or brings the forgiveness that we all take maybe for granted. Because, you know, salvation is free, but it costs somebody a lot to get it for us, right? There's no remission of sin without it. We believe in the blood atonement. That's what the Bible teaches. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, having obtained. And so here we are 2,000 years later. He's the surety of the covenant. 
Matthew 26, 28 talks about that, that again. It talks about the blood of the covenant. Uh, that he made it possible for all of us to have hope. He ministers in heaven with his own blood. You know, it's not yet over for Jesus. I read this in a very good place at one point. The sufferings of Jesus did not begin or end at the cross. But the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. It isn't over for Jesus yet. We say, yeah, he triumphed at the cross, but he still got us. The intercession on our behalf comes from one who has been there on the scary front lines of the battle. A war that began in heaven many centuries before. However, he doesn't intercede for us, nor does he substitute so that we can indulge our sins. This should do something to us. Christians are saved by looking. In fact, Christianity is the only faith religion in the world. And our faith leads us to one place, right? The place where Jesus died for our sins and now applies his blood to us. I read in another place, the third angel is pointing to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Ours is the third angel's message, right? To a world. The third angel is pointing to the most holy place. Out there in the desert where people were being bitten by the snakes and the poison was and the dead and dying were all around. Moses was told to build a, to make a serpent, a brass serpent, put it high on a pole where the people could see and tell people to look and live. And this was the story he told to Nicodemus. Even as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness. So um, we're saved by looking, not by doing, but by looking. The doing is the fruit of looking. <laughs> justified believers are justified because they've looked and they believed. And the fruit of that, when you see that, it breaks hearts. He wants us to view the atonement with reverence and enter into his rest from the power and presence of sin. The Sabbath is a sign between us and him that he's the one who sanctifies us, who brings us to fruition. That's the new life he offers to us. I've often wondered if those condemned and released soldiers went out in battle field with a renewed vigor and went on the front lines indeed. <laughs> Wasn't said in the story. But my guess is, having been delivered from the stockade and the next battle came up, they were right there on the front lines eager to do the work of the government. When we come to a knowledge of all this, there's created in the heart an enmity against sin. That very first covenant promise found in Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Jesus had the experience of hating sin and loving righteousness. He offers that to us as a gift. And if we allow the Holy Spirit access, he will come in and change our names to overcomer. Jacob was out there in the desert wrestling with none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And, and God knew that it was genuine. He said, I'm going to change your name from liar, from supplanter, to overcomer, which really means prince of God. He's called us to that kind of a, a situation. The promise to Laodicea is that we will sit with him in his throne. Overcomer. That's the name of the change. Rejoice, everyone. The battle is over. The victory is won. That's the name that God gave to this man, Jacob, who had been a big sinner. He 
gives us the opportunity and grace we need for repentance and pardon and the power to become overcomers in our lives. Spend some time every day meditating upon this, the closing scene, especially the closing scenes. Uh, you know, in one place I read, it'd be well if we had spent an hour a day contemplating the life of Christ and particularly the closing scenes. On Calvary, he made a provision. He made that provision reality as our high priest in heaven. He makes full application of the post provisions to every willing heart as our prayers ascend to the heavenly sanctuary where they are, where they are received by him. Just one day before Lincoln's assassination, he held a meeting with his cabinet. He met, brought, called them all together to discuss post-war reconstruction. One day now before he assassinated, reconstruction between the North and the South. Some of his advisors had been suggesting we need to punish the Confederate South. In response, Lincoln, Lincoln lifted up his large hands. Remember, he split rails. He was a strong man. He worked with his hands in early life. And uh, he lifted his big hands, his huge hands, and said, hold, hold, we must extinguish our resentment if we expect harmony and union. I can not sympathize with these strong feelings of revenge. This is the love principle on which Christ in all heaven operates. Only thereon, an infinitely grand scale, more than we could ever think or ask. Jesus bears no resentment that we were born enemies of his kingdom. In fact, that it was our sins that put him on the cross. He bears no revenge for that. No bad feelings. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Rather, instead, he chose to adopt us as his sons and daughters for eternity and reserves a place for us in his throne. I would like to read in closing here 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11. I think, I don't know if I meant, I don't know what I talk about in Bisbee and what I talk about here, so I might hear something again. But uh, <clears throat> chapter 14 of 1st. Of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians is about the second coming, right? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with, a, with the voice of God, the sound of the shout, the, shout of the, the, the sound of the trumpet and the, and the uh, voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise for Chapter 4 is a, is a revelation of the second coming. But chapter 5 tells how. Tells how we be ready for his second coming. I would invite you to read that whole chapter. It's a good seventh, uh, Sabbath afternoon read. But I want to read here verses uh, 9 to 11. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even also ye do. He wants to bring many sons to glory, it says in Hebrews 2.10. Many sons to glory. Jesus is our great Lincoln. The angels desire to look into these things. All this is powerful enough to pierce the hardest of hearts and to bring us to humility. With confidence, we can spend, spread the good news to our neighbors and friends around us. May it be so with all of us today. Let us sing with understanding the testimony of praise in our closing song. You can share this with your neighbors. It's a testimony to the lives. It's a, it's a testimony that lives in the heart of every true believer. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for those encouraging and thrilling words. 
There are two versions of redeemed. This is the one I always learned when I was a child or used to sing when I was a child. The, the other one is beautiful too, but this is the redeemed how I love to proclaim it. <laughs> Would you stand with me as we sing? Let's sing out now. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and So happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence mid me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. Child and forever I am. I know there's a crown that is waiting in yonder bright mansion for me, and soon with the saints made perfect at home with the Lord I shall be. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Please remain standing for the benediction. Our blessed Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to know some of these things. We pray that our understanding will grow, that our eyes and ears might remain open, and help us to every day take a long, hard look at Jesus and what our salvation cost. We pray, Lord, that it will break our hearts as we come down to the near end of this earth's history. We believe you're coming soon, Lord. We love your appearing. We pray, Lord, that you will put a desire in every one of our hearts to spend some quality time with you every day, studying your word, fellowshipping with you, so that this will be a walk and not a work. We pray, Father, that you will be with the needs, the several needs of all of us that are here this morning, each according to their need. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.